as you guys probably all know, because uh, we are in the Carolinas, so around here people probably know who my dad is a little bit more than other places. Um, just an update. So dad's 75 years old, and if you didn't know, we're going to put dad back in one of his race cars this year. So if you've been following along, there's a guy named Mitchell Stapleton who's got a YouTube channel called Stapleton42. Um, and we, he made this comment to Dad about, well, do you think he could drive a car still? Well, here's the deal. Dad goes up to the GoPro Motorplex uh, up in Mooresville and runs go-karts every single week at 75. He's still fast. So we took one of his old cup motors that made 690 horsepower back in the day Put it in the dyno this past summer. It was hurt a little bit. It only made 480. We freshened it back up. New piston rings. Um, Greg Anderson honed the block. Got Billy Godbold to do us a camshaft. Got some new springs. Made 780. We're so close to 800, we, ain't, we can't give up. I got one of Trevor's, get him uh, garages, carburetors back there, the twin blade deal. We're gonna work on the oil pump. And we ain't giving up till we get to 800. We're gonna put it back in the car. We're gonna go up to VIR, uh, which is a road course. And we actually have lap times from where he raced there in 2003. We're gonna go back to see if he can't run faster at 75 years old, 20 years after the fact than he did. So, but I ain't put, I'll, I'll put my money on the old man. He's quick, he's good, he's gonna do it. And it's gonna be a whole lot of fun. So that's, that's how dad's doing. So. What we're gonna do today is, you know, if you guys have been following along with any of the stuff we've been doing over the last couple of years uh, on YouTube and stuff, you're probably maybe somewhat confused as why a piston ring company is talking about honing all the time. I mean, I was over at Greg Anderson's place just the other day honing dad's other block, and it seems like we're talking about honing all the time. Well, there's a big reason why, because surface finish is one of the most important parts of getting your engine not just to seal up but to live you know thinking back to the nascar stuff you know 20 years ago the state-of-the-art ring package was an 043 043 three millimeter ring package those engines lasted one race then you had to tear them down and refresh them all up oh by the way by the end of that one race they were probably down you know five eight horsepower today they're running a 0.5 millimeter top ring. That's 020. 0.6 millimeter second ring, two millimeter wall ring. They're not duct to molly anymore. They're steel with a titanium nitride coating. Those short blocks will live 1,000, 1,500 race miles and be down nothing on power compared to what it was when it began. So the, the goal anymore isn't about making just more power to begin with. It's durable horsepower. You know, the Formula One Drive to Revive came out last night. My sons and I started watching that because my kids are into F1. They have to run those engines eight races. Eight. So it's not about making just more power now. It's about how do you maintain that durability of power, which is one of the big things we, why we're going to talk about surface finish so much. So... The number one thing when it comes to surface finish and why it's so incredibly important is because fuel is the enemy of your oil. Just let that sink in for a second. You look at these pictures of these injectors, the one on the bottom, you know, it's getting a pretty good atomization. And we all know this intrinsically because we're all engine people here. Engines don't burn liquid fuel. If we had a 55 gallon drum sitting right here, right now, with VPQ16, and we put a spark plug inside of it, and we hit the ignition, what happens? Not a damn thing. If you take that spark plug, and you put it at about an inch above the top of that barrel, and take the barrel lid off and do that, we're all gone. It burns vapors, not liquid. It's the job of the injector, and the job of the carburetor to atomize the fuel but then it has to vaporize. It's the heat of compression and the residual heat in the engine that causes it to vaporize. But if you think about this, if we had a, a little fire going right here, if you threw a little bitty tiny sliver of kindling in there, what happens to it? It burns right up. If we take a big old giant log and throw it on there, what happens? 
Not a damn thing. At least for a while, it'll eventually catch on fire. So think about that when we think about what's happening with these injectors. If you have a big liquid droplet of fuel going into the engine, it's hard for it to burn because it's hard for it to vaporize. But guess what it can do? It can wash that oil right off the cylinder wall. Because as the title of the seminar is, oil is the gasket between the piston ring and the cylinder wall and the piston. That ring has to seal against the ring groove and against the face of the cylinder wall. Anyone that's ever done a leak down check or compression check knows if you spray a little bit of WD-40 or put some transmission fluid or something in there, what happens to your numbers compared to where it was when it was dry? It goes up. Why? Because it's the gasket. It's what's causing it to seal. Fuel is the enemy of the seal. So we're going to go through a lot of different things today, but just kind of keep this picture in mind. Yeah, you got a piston, you got some rings, you got a cylinder wall, but that oil isn't just a lubricant, it's a gasket, which is why when we start talking about honing, it's so important. I should brought Ed Keebler up here with me to talk about this part because Ed's you know, smarter than I am when it comes to all this. But if you think about the changes that's happened in the honing industry in the last you know, 10 years or so, you've got these CNC homes, which are incredible. I was over at KB Racing uh, on Thursday, like I said, uh, honing dad's block. And that thing goes hole to hole. And once you kind of get a, your, we'll call it your recipe dialed in, it just repeats. Every cylinder just goes, it's so incredible. So you've got the CNC's that can do some amazing things. But then you also have a big difference between honing oil and coolant. So some of these you know, modern machines now, they have you know, water-based coolants, which is you know, great for sizing because it doesn't hold as much heat, but there's not as much lubricity either though. So when you're honing with diamonds, it actually does more smearing and stuff. And we've actually been able to see that with a microscope. If you haven't seen the microscope deal, come back by the booth later today before you get out of here and I can show you with the microscope, you can actually see the quality of the cut. And there's a big difference between having oil versus coolants. And oil doesn't mean just MAN 845. There's a stuff called Quaker Cut 004PE, which is a light non-sulfur oil which actually works really, really good with diamonds. And it's, so there's all these different things you can play with. Then you've got the fact that block materials have changed. You have, you have nicosil liners, you've got sumo bore, which is the plasma spray bore stuff uh, that comes in some of the Fords and some of the BMWs and other things now. Then you also have you know, different uh, abrasive options. You went from having the old school uh, vitrified abrasives. Now you've got diamonds, you've got CBNs. There's all these different variables that are going on. And if you start thinking about, say, the, just the hardness alone, you know, the old gray cast iron. You know, I was thinking about, was it Greg's? Those pro stock blocks are compacted graphite. So for the same abrasive on a compacted graphite block, he can't get the same numbers that we got on my dad's old Ford R block, which is the cast iron block. I mean, we had way more valley. Why? It's not as hard. So the harder the block material you go, you're gonna have to change your abrasive in order to keep up it if you're trying to get a certain valley depth. So then you get to some of these, you know, hybrid ductile irons, I mean, some of these darting sleeves, man, they're so hard. So you just gotta think about what's all going on. And then you go back to your abrasives. You know, the diamonds, I'm gonna use uh, Ed Keebler's analogy, is that it's more like if you take a, some dirt and you drag a stick through it, what happens? It makes a hole, right? But then it piles up on each side. So diamonds act more like a cutting tool than a traditional vitrified abrasive does. Where that vitrified abrasive is a particle, a silicon carbide or aluminum carbide, and it's gonna break off. And it's that third body piece of wear. You can see how different the surfaces look when you magnify them compared to the type of abrasive, which is why a lot of times now you're using a diamond for sizing. All right, so yeah, that roughing operation will be a diamond, then you're gonna come back in with a CBN. I mean, some guys even go vitrified over diamonds to clean it up, to create that plateau thing. 
And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that process in a minute. Because, you know, in the old days, you know, the, I think Dart had a sheet that came in the box. It said, you know, use a, a 220 and you go within three thousandths of size. Well, then you go from there to a 280 and then that's to a thousand. So then you finish with a 325 or a 400. Uh, if you finish more than two or three tenths with an abrasive, that's what your finish is. Because I'll show you some of these profilometer numbers. Just keep this in mind later. 100 micro inches is a tenth of a thousandth. Which means most surface finishes on your engines are a total of two tenths on a dive board gauge. Tenth each side. So if you take out a thousandth, all you got left is what you just finished honed with. That's the abrasive you got. So the idea of honing close to size and then doing stuff, ah, you gotta forget about that. You gotta basically hone to size, then you're counting strokes or doing, uh, doing time. It's one of those functions. That's the, the change in mentality. Again, we're talking a whole lot about honing and not much about piston rings. But there's a reason for that. So think about what the, the job of the piston ring is. Number one, it's there to be a seal. You know, it's not a structural component of the piston. The wrist pin is, absolutely. The backbone of the piston is really important. You don't need a 16th, 16th, 316th ring to have durability. If any of you guys watched the Engine Performance Expo we did back in January, that LS engine made uh, 1,300 something horsepower. We made 13 runs the last day at over 1,250 horsepower with off-the-shelf Mala uh, pistons. Those are Mala Power Pack pistons. That's a 4032 piston, isn't it? Yeah. Uncoated wrist pin. Shelf piston, 112. 1,250 horsepower pulls, 13 of them. We're doing in-cylinder combustion analysis on all eight cylinders. Not a single cylinder lost power. After 13 runs on a one millimeter, one millimeter, two millimeter ring package on an off-the-shelf 4032 piston. Don't tell me you gotta have 16, 16, 3 16 rings to make power. Now, top fuel, that's different, you know, but, you know, a boosted LS making a thousand horsepower, you don't need anything more than that. Because the ring materials are so much better. You know, but the idea of the ring is gonna seal, it's gonna transfer heat to the cylinder wall, it's gonna maintain the proper volume of oil. Because again, oil's a gasket, you don't want to scrape too much away, but oil also has a lower octane value than your fuel. So you want to make sure you've got the correct oil ring tension for the viscosity of oil you're running, because you don't want to leave too much oil up there, because that can lead to knock, and knock's a bad thing. Because if we were knocking that engine, we would have not made <laughs> that, many, that many pulls, that much power, and it still lived. Now, the main reason we can go to these thinner rings with better conformability, and sometimes even better heat transfer, uh, and less thermal uh, degradation, is because we're going from old school cast iron or ductile iron, materials that are the old way of doing it there's a lot of scrap a lot of waste a lot of inconsistency in the material to now we're calling from wire be it uh, stainless steel or tool steel the the wire is so much better we can coil it very quickly very precise and the great thing about steel is just that steel is a better material it's got better strength it's handles the heat better so when you go to steel it's just a, again better base material then we can begin to change on the coatings and the coatings have really made a big difference anyone that's used a dlc coated wrist pin you already know where i'm going i mean i think the dlc coated wrist pin was like one of the greatest things ever invented for an internal combustion engine the dlc is wonderful as long as it stays intact but it, that same advantage that dlc gives you on a wrist pin we can apply that to piston rings. Maybe not necessarily DLC, but we've got a lot of different coating options. You know, in the old days, you had a cast ring. Oh, by, by the way, this is 2023, so we're, we're a year late. You know the piston ring's 171 years old? Isn't that nuts to think? The piston ring was invented before the internal combustion engine was ever dreamt of. 
Before there was an oil well, the first oil ever drilled was in Titusville, Pennsylvania on August 27th, 1859. The piston ring was invented like 20 years before that for steam locomotives over in England. A guy named John Ramsbottom. That's a great name, isn't it? Ramsbottom. Uh, but back in the day, they were just old cast iron rigs. And then we got around to doing, you know, ductile iron and things, but then we got the, the molly ring. So the, the molly ring's been the staple for a long, long time. I said it even you know, 20 years ago, it was the state of the art deal in NASCAR. The only downside of molly is, or the, the gray side of molly is it's soft, it has porosity, so it holds oil. So that was one thing that made it really easy and very forgiving on honing is because the molly would hold the oil. Well, then we got, you know, chrome. Well, chrome's really hard, super durable. But the trick is chrome, I mean, that's like a chrome bumper. It's got, it's plate, it's a dip. So it's got lumps and bumps. You ever put together an engine that's got maybe some high tension oil rings? And the oil rings obviously are chrome faced. And you see streaking in the bore up and down when you put it together? Those are the high spots from the chrome. That's what does it. Once it wears in a little bit, it all goes away, doesn't it? Yeah, that's just because those are the high spots in the chrome breaking in. When you get away from those and you get down to like WCC, which is tungsten carbide carbon, which is a little bit harder than molly, then you got CRN, you know, chrome nitride. The same stuff that's on titanium valves that makes it chrome looking is chromium nitride. So it's a PVD type of coating that's similar to chrome. It's hard, it's really good. It's about 1,700 Vickers hardness. Then you've got titanium nitride, the gold coating. If you've got a good, like a, a gold coated drill bit or insert that's like your favorite one that lasts forever and cuts great, the reason it does it is because it's titanium nitride. That's what gives it that gold color. It's super hard, it's low friction. So we actually have, you know, the top rings then the cup stuff, that's what it is. It's titanium nitride. In fact, we actually just did some, some testing here recently where we can do a titanium nitride process to oil rails. So you can get rid of chrome and have titanium nitride on the oil rails instead, which is a benefit. And of course, then you have DLC. The trick to all four of those bottom coatings, they're all harder, they all have lower friction, and they all live longer than the ones on top. The downside is none of them hold oil. This is why we talk about honing so much and why I have a profilometer everywhere I go is because something has to hold the oil. The cylinder wall has to do all the work. That's the, really the, the key to this whole thing is there's no way those rings are going to ever hold enough oil or have enough lubricity to make the thing work. So that surface finish has got to hold the oil because the oil is the gasket. All right, so you know me, I'm an oil guy. So I look at engines from the perspective of the oil. So in oil engineering, we have this thing called the Strybeck curve. And the thing that I love about piston rings more than anything else is that the piston ring experiences all three stages of lubrication on every single engine cycle. Because what does a piston ring have to do twice each stroke? Audience participation. It's got to stop, right? So, uh, we're for those who are super local, uh, Tuckertown Lake, which is you know about 45 minutes or so north of Concord. That's where we go water skiing. So we've been water skiing since Dad. Uh, so, so I've been around a lot. Of Dad's goes water skis. So, what? Where's the skier when the boat's not moving? He's down in the water. Okay. So imagine that is your boundary condition. That's the lowest speed, highest load. But then as the boat begins to accelerate, what does the skier do? He starts to come up, right? He's not all the way up yet, you're kind of coming up. Well, that's that mixed film uh, perspective. Then once the boat's moving, the skier's up on top of the water. That's full film, that's your hydrodynamic. So at mid stroke, that's the fastest the piston's moving, the rings and the, and the piston, they're in full film. They're in that hydrodynamic regime. But as that piston nears top dead center, as it begins to slow down and compression begins to build, now we get pushed over into the mixed film condition. Then when the piston ring stops, it's in boundary condition. 
So when things are in the hydrodynamic, that's all about the viscosity of the oil. When you get into that mixed and in the boundary, that's where the additive package in the oil starts to kick in. Of course, when you put a coating on the ring, it can also begin to play into that, that scenario. So just keep that in mind because when you're talking about lubrication, we're talking about the four R's. Right oil, that means the right viscosity and additive package for the application. I could talk for an hour just about that. I won't, we'll move on. <laughs> Right? There's plenty of YouTube videos you can go watch that I've done about that. But at the right place, the right time, the right amount. Note that the oil itself is only one of the four. The other three are just as critical. Because if you get one of them wrong, guess what happens? You have a bad day. So keeping the oil in the right place, right time, right amount, that's all about having enough oil on the cylinder wall. Right? We got that fuel trying to wash it away. We are trying to create this valley to hold the oil to keep everything lubricated properly. And like I said before, if you start looking at one of these profilometers, so if, for example, this trace right here, the scale is plus 200 micro inches, minus 200 micro inches. What did I say earlier? 100 micro inches is a tenth of a thousandth. So this whole scale is four tenths. Almost all of that surface is one tenth of a thousandth. Again, it's too many two tenths on a Dalbor gauge. So again, keep that in mind as we move forward. Because what you want here is it's Goldilocks and the three bears. One of my favorite chemical analogies, and it works in engines too. You don't want it too rough, because that's gonna cause abrasion, but you don't want it too smooth either. I remember back when I was working at Gibbs, we got into polishing the camshafts and everything. We got the camshafts to an RA of less than two, and we burned all the camshafts up. Why? Because we didn't hold enough oil. We made it too smooth. There was no oil retention anymore. So you gotta have the right amount of roughness in there. So that's that, again, that Goldilocks and the three bears. Now, I just mentioned RA, and the reason I mentioned it is because you need to forget about RA. RA will lie to you. It's a useless, oh, some people will tell me it's not useless, but it's useless for what we do, right? It, it's, you need to have a better picture of what's going on. So what we do is we begin to talk about these numbers. All right, so that profilometer is gonna take a trace, but what we can do is we can kind of begin to analyze that trace. And there's a couple of things we can do. So the first thing we wanna do is what's called our material ratio curve. And that's gonna give you the idea of what that slope is. So that little blue area over here, that's your RPK. That's the stuff that's sticking up. That's what the ring is gonna be contacting and hitting. So remember, this is a cylinder wall here. The ring's moving up here. So it's gonna start knocking down all those peaks. Then that RK is your core roughness. Then the RVK, that's your valley depth. Those are the reservoirs for the oil. So the RK is what's gonna give you the supply, what the ring's interfacing with, is gonna be the RK. The RVK is that valley to make sure that they stay full, that there's always enough there. So and this is a little plot from you know, a 2D, just a regular profilometer. But if you wanna look at these numbers, the idea of the RPK, the RK, the RVK, and put it in practice and put it in 3D, here you go. So this is a 325 diamond single grit finish home. And we're taking a 3D profilometer trace of just one section. Those big red peaks at the end, that's the unworn part. That's where the ring stopped. So imagine that's at the top of the, uh, the ring travel, top of the cylinder, TDC. This is that, you can see that little bit of shade of green here is just slightly less than all the others. That's exactly where the ring stopped. And if you zoom in on it, you know, top rings are barrel faced. You can actually see the barrel on that spot because that's right where it stopped. But then as the ring moves away, like that water skier, what's it doing? It's getting thicker and thicker and thicker. And you can see there at the very end, the red's coming back up. So all these areas down here in blue, those are the valleys. That area in green is the RK, and the area in red 
is your RPK. So when we're talking about those numbers and these things, this is what it looks like. This is what the engine is actually seeing. So we got this information by what's calling this a plant, it's a reciprocating rig. So this is a section of liner. We actually took a melling liner, we honed it, different finishes, and we took a section of ring, and then we can rub it back and forth in there just like it is in the engine, but then we are eliminating all the other variables going on in the engine. And we can look at just the effects of the oil, the ring, the hone, we can check it all out. So what we're gonna do right now is go through the results of some of these testing, because I think it's super cool. I hope you think it's cool too. We'll find out. So, like I said, we can vary all the information. We can change the speed. We can change the load. We can change the temperature. So what we actually did is we actually built a break-in simulation. You know, for anyone that's seen me speak before and watched the videos and stuff, you know that we do a lot of testing out at Ron Shaver's place at Shaver Specialty Racing Engines. And we were, when I was at Driven, we did all of our oil testing there. We used flat tap and stuff. So we would do that same 30 minute break in, 2,800 RPM, about 85 to 90 foot pounds of load. Then we made, you know, three consecutive power runs from 3,000 to 6,000 RPM. We built that model in this. So it will actually replicate that same speed, same load, increasing procedure on the cylinder that we did for the camshaft. Because we also noticed when we were doing that, that when we did a cam break in, it would break in the rings perfectly. There was nothing, no, nothing changed after that. So it worked out pretty good. So even though with an engine that wasn't a flat tap, it, if you treated it the same way, actually worked out pretty good for it. Like I said, we can actually see these pieces here where we've you know, honed those sections of liners, different finishes, and they, we can do from the hardware side, we can change the surface finish, we can change the ring coatings, then we can also change the oil. So we began with a baseline 325 grit, that's a 325 diamond, with an uncoated ring using just off the shelf API oil, just regular old stuff. And you can see the wear scar. So this is the whole travel where the ring was going. All right, this is top dead center where there's gonna be the highest amount of load. This is the bottom where it's not gonna be as much load. You can kind of see that. Unrun area, unrun area. And on the seat, you can see the highest peaks here on both of those. So when you do the used oil analysis, because it runs in oil, we had 80 parts per million iron, which is of course that's an iron liner. So that's where it's gonna come from. Now we took the same thing and we put a coated ring on it. And it instantly gets better because now we're only at 50 parts per million iron. Now we got a little bit of debris dragging in there, which is that's one thing to remember. When you have those higher peaks, what's gonna happen to them? They're gonna get mowed down. So it's going to probably do more damage because they're dragging all around. But overall, the wear was still quite a bit less. Then we actually brushed it, right? Actually, no, sorry, this one we actually swapped the oil from the regular API oil and then put in braking oil, put in the correct chemistry. Higher ZDP, less friction modifiers, less detergent, and now the wear drops down to 33 parts per million. And you see that there's now no more debris, and like before, with the ring stop, so you see it gets lower, mid-stroke, hydrodynamic, there's less wear, back and forth, so it's very even and uniform. So things are getting better as we're adding coatings, changing the oil chemistry, things are getting pretty cool looking. Now, we went in and we brushed that same surface before we ran the test. So with brushed the coated ring back to the regular oil, you can hardly tell where it stops. Like right over here, you can see this is rougher than that, because that's right where the ring stops, right about there. Still way different than before. Now we add in the correct oil, and we're now down to 20 parts per million iron. We went from 80 to 20. I think on a percentage basis, that's a 75% reduction in wear, just by changing the ring coating, how we hone it, and the oil. I think that's a pretty good number, don't we agree? 
Y'all you know, like to make 75% improvements on things are pretty good. That's, that's what we like. I'm a tribologist, so that's friction wear, lubrication. This is, this, is my, this is my jam. I love this stuff. Okay, so we know that smoothing it out on top, giving it an easier, cleaner running surface was good. Now let's actually see that when you take that same profilometer with that microscope, we can also go here right to where the ring stops traveling. So it doesn't say you have to run it only on one section. I can run right across between the worn and unworn part, right? So this is the worn part here, unworn here, then flip it over, worn here, unworn there. And you can see with that profilometer trace, man, that part's wiped out, it's gone. It just mowed everything down, that surface is level and killed. Well, let's start looking at the difference between the unrun parts. Y'all notice the difference in the amount of valley in the unrun, or the, uh, this one that, that survived versus this one that didn't survive? What did we say right, proper lubrication was? Right oil, right place, right time, right amount. Same oil, same ring. The difference is the finish not enough valley here to retain enough oil, not enough RK in here to support the load, that finish got wiped out. So that's why we're talking about, this is so incredibly important, not just for how much power it makes new, but how long will it last? How durable is that finish gonna be? That's why when you start adding those valleys, increase, that RK, you can really make a difference in what's going on. So we did some guidance numbers. If you're still using uh, the old profilometer, you really can't with the Mitotelio, it can't, the screen auto scales. So you can't look at the graph. It doesn't really tell you what you need. So you're gonna have to kind of you know, fly by the numbers, which is better than flying blind. So typically, say you know 90% of your applications, you're gonna want an RPK somewhere in that 10 to 15 range. RK in the 35 to 40 range, and then RVK in the 50 to 60. That's a pretty good finish. It'll work for most applications. When you start adding boost, what are we doing besides putting more air into the engine? Putting more fuel in the engine, aren't we? We talked about earlier, the more fuel you put to that cylinder, the more it's trying to wash the oil away. So what do we need to do? We need to bump up that RVK. We need to give it more valley to retain more oil because it's going to get tried to wash away and then we get into some of these crazy diesel applications uh i know they did one of these aera deals uh last summer up at jeremy waggler's i wasn't there keith was there and what i was told was jeremy started off the whole day he held up one piston and rod assembly in one hand and it was like literally black like burnt gone he held up another one on the other hand and it looked brand new. And he said, these are the exact same piston and ring combinations. This is last year and I was about to quit because we could barely get engines off the dyno, couldn't even make a whole weekend. They were almost like top fuelers having to change rings and pistons and stuff at the racetrack. All we changed to get to this was surface finish. They went from an RVK of somewhere around like 40 to 50 to 140. It's all they changed with surface finish. And the engine went from something that could barely live to something that could run all season, look brand new. Now, because diesels are the worst case scenario, because it's direct injection, you're running compound turbos making a couple hundred PSI boost, can you imagine how much fuel you're having to put into that cylinder? So those diesels are the worst case scenario. They need more valley than probably any other application because it's direct injection. You are just hosing fuel in there like out of a fire hose. So that's why they have to have that much valley. But we can learn from that and say, okay, how do I apply that to what I'm doing? Because if you're running a gasoline engine, you're not running as much fuel as someone running methanol all else things being considered, being equal. But now if I'm running boost, 
I got to think about that. If I'm running boost with methanol, I got to add even more value. So hopefully this gives you kind of a, a perspective of what different parts and pieces go together and how this whole ring seal soup starts to come together because it's really about that. You know, we can go to Indy at the end of the year and go up to PRI and you can go out to, to dinner at St. Elmo's. You can have a steak dinner and you know what, they're gonna bring the steak, they're gonna have the navy bean soup or the shrimp cocktail or this or that. If you don't like one of them, you don't have to eat it. But if you go to a restaurant and you order soup, you order New England clam chowder, either you like it or you don't. This and ring seal is soup, it's not steak. You gotta have the home, you gotta have the oil, you gotta have the rings, everything has to work together. If you don't have it all working together, it ain't gonna work. It's not gonna last. So think about it that way, a great resource if you're really gonna start digging into this stuff is the Surface Texture Answer Book uh, from Carl Mussoff and Mark Malberg. Mark Malberg is a brilliant man that I, when I worked at Driven and working with Billy at Comp, when we were doing all that camshaft testing, we were using his software called OmniSurf because we would actually measure the used cams. Right? But we would measure them with a the profilometer before they went in the engine and after they came out of the engine to actually measure the wear scar to know how well the oil was working. He's a genius. He worked for Cummins, now he consults with all the big OEMs. The great thing about this book is it's literally a question and answer format. So if you have a question about a certain topic, you don't have to read the whole book. You can just go to that one question, find that question, read that one section, and back off you go. So it's a really, if you buy a profilometer, you start really getting into this stuff, it's a great resource to have because you're gonna have questions. Then you can go write the book and get the answer. So, I mentioned breaking oil earlier. So I will tell you, of course, I'm biased because I used to work there and I formulated this stuff. So full, full disclosure, yeah, I'm biased. But I'll say this, there's a reason I'm biased. It works. I tested enough stuff to know what works and what doesn't work. I can tell you what you don't want in oil when you're trying to break in steel piston rings that are PVD coated. You don't want molybdenum. It doesn't help it. It actually slows the process down. Absolutely. So a good proper breaking oil doesn't have molly in it. Camshaft guy may not like me for saying that, but I don't really care. I'm a piston ring guy now. I can have, I want to have my bias on my side. I want my piston rings to live. I don't want molly in my oil. You also don't want calcium. You don't want a high level of detergent. You, you definitely don't want sodium in the oil. So what made the stuff work way back in the day, because whether you know this or not, Joe Gibbs Racing was one of the very first teams to begin to run the steel rings from Total Seal back in the early 2000s. It just so happened we were developing our oil at the same time. This ring seal soup I'm talking about, we've been cooking the same recipe for about 20 years now. And we've made enough mistakes in the kitchen to know what works and what doesn't work. So what I can tell you is when it comes to the recipe, what ingredients you put in the oil, you don't want friction modifiers. You need to have ZDP, but too much is a bad thing. Back to going locks and the three bears. You don't want less than this. You don't want a ton more than that. I'd say that window is probably somewhere 1,500 to like 2,500 uh, PPM of ZDP is about all you need uh, to break in. Now the flat tap it will like a higher. If it's a roller, you can get away a little bit less. But having the detergent, you know, 500 ppm or less, that's what lets the ZDP work and do its job. And you already saw the results. Big difference, wasn't there, on what's going on. So, yeah, I'm biased, but I'm also biased because the results tell me that's the direction you should go. Now, kind of in conclusion before we get to some questions, and hopefully there's some questions, you know, the, the, the thing that's really changed all of this, right, the first domino to fall, was that we evolved the piston ring materials. You know, we went away from cast materials, you know, plasma molly, the old school way of doing things, hard chrome. When we've gone into much better materials, we've gone into these PVD coatings that have low friction, but the problem is they don't have any oil retention. So now we've had to move towards 
making the cylinder do all that work. But the trick with that is now we have blocks that are different hardness. We've got spray bore liners and things like that. So we got all these other complexities. Now you throw around that we got to change that honing technique. That old school multi-step process isn't going to get it done when we're trying to create a more engineered surface. So we got to think about a different way of doing it. We want that deeper RVK so we can hold more oil in order to be able to provide lubrication and seal because the oil is going to do both of those things. And with that, I left this about 12 minutes for questions to stay on Mr. Fox's schedule because I've been notoriously one that runs over, so I'm trying to do better today, Mr. Fox. He's not listening. Okay, fire away. So on the um, brush. Yep, on the brush. Is that the plateau brush in the honing machine, or is that a fecal barrier? Thing? Okay, so the question was when we brush those cylinders, was that a plateau brush or the dingle ball hone? That was a plateau brush. And that was just a couple of strokes with the plateau brush, not using it several strokes. In fact, yesterday, me and Bob <laughs> were playing around uh, doing a video because, you know, sometimes I've been accused of being Rottler biased. Well, I mean, I, I do love Ed, and we appreciate the guys from Rottler. They actually sponsored my boss's car. So we really, really appreciate the guys at Rottler. They're a great marketing partner. And, and the reality is this. Whether it's a Rottler or a Sun in the CV uh, or the SV uh, line that, where it's the CNC home with you know, 6, 8, 12, 16 abrasives, it's going to make the, the cylinder straighter and rounder. And it's going to seal better. Absolutely. But can you get the correct finish with an old CV16? Oh, hell yeah, you can. We did it yesterday uh, over there, right? And we were just playing around after we actually got it right, I said, hey, we need to get some B-roll of us, you know, the thing honing. It's, we went, ran about 30 seconds, extra with the brush in there. Oh my God, what it did to that surface. Yeah, you don't want to run the brush at more than just a couple of strokes. I mean, at 30 seconds of the brush, it basically destroyed that surface. Other questions? Corey. So, getting away from this, but something else, if you don't mind, do you know a surface finish for cam shaft? Because I've got a situation where I've got a roller cam out of a race engine that tracked a hot spot. So I've been thinking about oil, I've been thinking about all kinds of things, but I haven't thought about surface finish holding it. Okay, surface, so the question was surface finish for cam shaft. So the, I say the biggest thing I remember when being there at comp, working with Billy on that for roller cam stuff was they actually began to grind in a, uh, a radius, basically. So it was arced, you know, so it was basically uh, convex. So that, think about a flatbed truck. If there's nothing loaded on a flatbed truck, is it flat? No, it's got kind of an arc to it. So that when you load it, it goes back down. So they started to grind the roller cam stuff, especially the big spring pressure stuff, with that same kind of arch to it, so that when you loaded it, it actually came back flat, because that material is going to move, right? That way you have more of a contact patch versus it edge loading. So I'm not sure where, where it's tracking, but surface finish in the camshaft, I think we had to back up to, back that we were only doing RA back then, I think we had to back up to like around like a three or a four. I think if you get below four, you're really getting to be really too smooth and you're not going to hold enough oil. Yeah, you can over polish it for certain. And that thing with a belt polisher, you can create waviness in there that takes away load bearing area. You know, that's one of Billy's favorite stories is uh, a buddy of mine, Roger England, that used to work for Cummins, was talking to Billy one day at PRI about, you know, the load carrying capacity they had, right? So, you know, Cummins building these engines last a million miles. And I don't remember all the different grades of steel. You know, Billy's got his chest all puffed out because he's got, you know, this you know, unobtainium level of steel. And the guy's like, so what if I told you I've got this, you know, junk steel that has three times the load carrying capacity of yours? You know, like you can see Billy's head start to turn and do the math and say like, well, you can't get three times more uh, strength out of that material. That, that, that material doesn't exist. And he's like, I have a 92% load bearing area on my cam. How much do you have on yours? 
and it was around like 20 percent so you had this incredible steel that only 20 percent of that load was actually carrying load whereas at cummins 92 percent of that surface was carrying load because they had engineered the surface oh by the way did i mention that mark Malberg, who writes all the software used to work for cummins yeah this all this comes together is that surface finish is absolutely critical I wish when I was working on the wool stuff, I had known what I know now about surface finish because I swear there were so many things that sent you in the wrong direction and you tried to fix a problem that wasn't a problem with the chemistry. You were trying to band-aid the fact that it was a surface finish problem because it's a, it's a huge piece. Any other questions? Yes, sir. All right, so he's asking a question about conversion chart for the, we call it the new oil specifications back to the old ones. So I'm gonna tell you right now, the current API SP, which is the, the newest one, is the best oil that I've seen in my lifetime. And the reason why it's better is because they've lowered the detergent level. So because uh, calcium and sodium, which are detergents in motor oil traditionally, can cause low speed pre-ignition in direct injection engines and because the majority of uh, internal combustion engines being built by the OEMs today are direct injected, they had to come up with a new uh, additive package and test that screened for low speed pre-ignition. So what happened is it's eliminated all the sodium in the oil. So there aren't shelf oils now that have sodium detergent in it. And it took what was it used to be primarily calcium, pretty much all calcium, and you'd be probably in the 2,700 to 3,300 parts per million range of calcium in the oil. Well, if you have more than about 1,500, 1,600 parts per million calcium, it will cause low speed pre-ignition. So they've chopped the uh, level of detergent in the motor oil in half or more than half. But the ZDP level stayed the same. So what did it do? It made the ZDP that's already in the oil more effective. So the SP oils are actually better. I know for a long time, oil got worse and it got worse and it got worse. But why was it getting worse? They kept jacking up the detergent level. Oh, 10,000 mile drain intervals, 15,000 mile drain intervals. That is a jar garbage. What they were doing is they were bumping up the detergency level so that the OEMs could go to longer drain intervals. Why do they want to do that? Because the EPA gives them credit toward their cafe fuel economy requirements if they have less waste oil. And JD Power gives you lower cost of ownership if you have less oil changes. It had nothing to do with the health of the engine. They would still get it through warranty. But the lowest wear rate comes from having more frequent oil changes. And TBN is not something you should even care about anymore. If you don't know what TBN is, it's total base number, it's the way they would determine acid level in the oil. It was developed back in the old days when we had high sulfur fuels. Do we have high sulfur fuels anymore? No. So both Cummins and GM don't even look at TBN anymore. It's, to them, it's a dinosaur tied up to old high sulfur fuels. Today's fuels don't create strong acids. They only create weak acids, and TBN doesn't detect weak acids. So it's a big, big change, but I, I'm not bagging and worried about the modern oils now. They're actually way better than they were. Now, does that make them a race oil? No, no. You're building race engines, you need a race oil. It still shouldn't have a donut on it, on the back of the, the bottle, if you're putting a race motor. My two cents. Any other questions? Come on, there's going to be a question out there somewhere. Throw me a curveball, Jimmy, make me look stupid. <laughs> Well, if there's no more questions, then thank y'all for, oh, here's one, there we go. On direct injection engines, like the Hondas, mm -hmm. they're having an awful lot of problems with the rings, and they're using, they're using oil somewhere up to a 
road for 500 miles, brand new cars. Honda doesn't want to fix them. Uh, they said that's normal. <laughs> Court and 500 miles normal. So he's saying on the Hondas, they're having, with the direct injections, they're having a lot of oil consumption. Mm -hmm. How do you get, how do you clean that? Is that through fuel injection cleaner? Or because I presume it's carbon forming around the ring, not in the first ring. So yeah, so we actually did a video uh, that's on the Tuggle Seal YouTube channel. Uh, we, AAA, everybody knows what AAA is, they did an independent study between we we'll call it standard fuel and top tier fuel. I'm not talking about you know 87 versus 93. This is 93 standard fuel. So the EPA has a minimum requirement for detergency and motor er, detergency and gasolines. It's called the LAC, lowest additive concentration. So you go to the discount gas station. That's probably going to be the LAC blend. Um, so they did compared the 93 just regular fuel versus 93 what they call it top tier. So top tier is a uh, non-government program that's kind of a consortium of a lot of the different manufacturers and some of the, the fuel companies that have a higher level of detergency. There is a 19 times difference between the regular 93 and the top tier 93. Specifically, the regular fuel had 19 times more deposits than the top tier fuel did on intake valves. All right, so the question was, well, that's intake valves. That doesn't matter for direct injection. Wrong. Let's go back to our second slide here, right? If we go all the way back to the very beginning, when we're talking about direct injection, yep, the, that, that injector is definitely downstream of the intake valve. And that's the problem, because where is it? In the combustion chamber. So when you shut that engine off, how hot's that exhaust valve? How hot's that exhaust stream coming out of there? All that heat's in there. When you turn the engine off, that's when the fuel cokes inside the injector. So what happens is the injector begins to clog because carbon deposits build up in the injector when you turn it off. It's absolutely critical for direct injection engines to run top tier fuel or use some type of fuel additive to keep it clean. What's happening to those engines is that they're getting dirty injectors because their people are running cheap fuel without the good additives in it. Once that injector begins to carbon up and now it's just dumping liquid fuel in there, what's gonna happen to your cylinder wall finish? It's gonna wipe it out. Once the cylinder wall finish is wiped out, what's gonna happen? Oil consumption, there's no bringing it back. How would John Q. Public know that? People like me telling the story. But that, that's the reality is that DI engines need the fuel injector cleaner probably worse than a port injected engine does. My son is actually working over at Rick's place at RF Engines, and he, he shows me these pictures of all these nasty, uh, well, he's got the BMW engines and they get the Mini Cooper engines in there. All right, and the funny thing is, guess what? BMW builds both of them. But the Mini Cooper engines are just nasty compared to the BMW engines. Are they really that different as an engine design? They're both DI engines. What's the difference? The dude that owns the BMW is going to go spend the money and buy the Shell V power and all that stuff. The dude that buying the Mini Cooper is going to freaking Costco or whatever and getting cheap gas. I'm telling you, that's the dead serious. Costco is. is oh yeah, top, Costco is top tier. You're right, Greg. Right, yeah. Bad, bad one, right? Discount corner gasoline station with no branding. That's the guy <laughs> that's got the bad fuel, you know. So. It, Fuel is a huge, huge deal. It's a big, big variable. And I think that's something we've kind of missed in all of this is what a giant impact fuel makes in all of this. So it's something that really you should pay attention to. Especially when you see something that looks weird, start looking at the fuel first almost. Any other questions? All right, well thanks guys, appreciate y'all coming.